It's, uh, it's always uh, very nice to hear the buzz of conversation because you know that people are excited and thinking and have things to say to each other. Um, so I'm sorry to stop you, but I think you're in for a treat. So this is um, a good thing to do. It is uh, a great pleasure always to introduce someone who you admire. Um, and Eric Kandel is certainly someone I have known for a long time and admired for many years. Um, way back when we were both somewhat younger and I was shifting from physics to neuroscience, I went to visit Eric down at, uh, I was at Columbia, where I was for many years a colleague. Uh, but at that point, um, Eric was down in NYU. Now, we're talking about 1972 or 73. I couldn't find a picture of Eric for that particular year. So I found a picture in 1968 and one in 1978. So you have to imagine what he looked like. He was <laughs> somewhere in between there. The other thing I'd like you to notice because he has become so identified with a red bow tie is that he can also wear other ties. <laughs> anyway, it was, uh, it was a very revealing moment for me to actually talk to someone who had already produced a lot of uh, wonderfully um, thoughtful and incisive neuroscience as I was trying to uh, decide what I was going to do, and I did not follow his example, I have to say. I, I got more interest in development rather than learning and memory, but whether that was a good decision or not, I will not go into that. But I thought I would, since you already have a little biography there in, in the book, and, and he should get here as fast as possible, I thought, I would just tell you a little bit about things that Eric has done. You already know he has the Nobel Prize and many, many other recognitions. He's uh, received uh, honorary degrees from lots of places and so on. Um, he, I would say, is like Steve Hall. He's one of the heavyweights in our field. So we have two wonderful heavyweights here. Uh, but I thought since I'd been trying to think about how to introduce neuroscience to architects that I would give you a little bit of an assignment. Okay, so here are a few articles by Eric Kandel. Uh, and you can all go to, you know, to uh, some of the databases. This particular one happens uh, to be um, from uh, NCI National, well, whatever, PubMed. <laughs> So I looked up this morning just for fun to see where he is at. And uh, his, all this article is number 500 in the list. So your assignment is to go and look up the rest of them. <laughs> I picked number 490 in this because that was the first article I read by Eric. And uh, you can see that it goes back a few years. Okay, so it gives you an idea of, of how long uh, his career has been. Okay, so that is the article in actually 467 is the one that I first read. The one above that is the first article that he started to, when he started to work on Aplesia, which I'm sure you'll hear a bit about. And, and it's in French. And although I read Spanish perfectly, I don't read French that well. So I skipped that one. And then I thought I'd show you one of the more recent ones because more recently, Eric has been focusing a lot on really interesting questions about how our mind changes as it is affected by certain types of environments, which we won't talk about here, we talk about architecture. But there are other kinds of environmental uh, influences on, on our brains, and this article is really a very remarkable one. So as a, a really more interesting assignment, I thought I'd go through a few of his books. 
Uh, this book was actually originally published in 1981. It was by Eric, Jimmy Schwartz, and Tom Jessel. And they've added a couple of, of, uh, of uh, additional editors. He's the main editor of this book. If you want to learn neuroscience, this is the Bible, okay? It's a little tough for architects, but there are parts of it that I think you would find really quite enjoyable. But Eric, who has been an, you know, a neuroscientist, a hardcore neuroscientist for a long time, has also been trying to bring neuroscience to a more, let's say, readable level. And this is a wonderful book that he published with Larry Squire, who is here somewhere. Whoops, <laughs> there's Larry. Uh, and the reason I, I thought of this book in particular is that it's a book I have assigned as a reading in some of our classes for what are called brain and buildings or architecture and neuroscience. It's a wonderful book, second edition here. You can get it from Amazon. Uh, I, I think it's still available. Uh, here's another book. Um, I have to confess I have not read this book. I find it daunting to read a book <laughs> that says psychiatry at the top of it. So. But I am sure you would learn a lot from it. But this, this is a book you really, um, I mean, someone yesterday was talking about Damasio's contributions and so on. I think Eric's contribution is even more remarkable. Uh, and it's a book that won several awards as a presentation for the more general reader. And I highly recommend it. It's, it's a great book. Now, when we were thinking about this conference, I had been reading this book of Eric's, which I found remarkably interesting. And it, it, it is an exposition of an area that Eric has been thinking deeply about all his life. Uh, he actually, when he was an undergraduate, he was focused on history. And um, you know, somehow or other, he got into medicine, psychiatry, and so on. But he never left that interest that he has in history, in art, and in fact, in, in how art um, presents a different view of the world to us. Anyway, it's a remarkable book. I highly recommend it. And now, the last book, which you saw in Steve Hall's presentation, which just was published by Columbia University Press. Uh, I have not read it. I didn't get it. I didn't fly anywhere, so I didn't have time to read it. But I am sure that it will be a great read. So for all of you who are getting points, sorry, getting points for, you know, in architecture, for being here at this conference, the assignment is to now go and buy and read the book. And you will get a heck of a lot out of it, particularly after you hear Eric. Okay, I want to finish this uh, too long introduction by uh, making a personal note. I found an old picture of Eric and Denise when they were married in 1956, right out of NYU Medical School, I believe. And so this is a more recent picture. I don't know if it's totally today or not, but I think it's 60 years of a wonderful partnership. So, Eric. Fantastic. Eduardo, I, I don't know how to respond to this. Uh, I just wish my parents were here. My father would be proud, and my mother would have believed it. <laughs> um, it's very difficult to follow Eduardo uh, and Stephen Hall. Um, Stephen Hall showed you creativity in action. Uh, I'm not going to be able to do that. What I will show you is a description of how other people's creativity manifests itself. And a problem I've been particularly interested in, which fits in with architecture, and that is how 
groups form and stimulate each other to new levels of creativity. Uh, and that is true in art as well as in science. So the central challenge for science in the 21st century is to understand the human mind in biological terms. The possibility of meeting that challenge opened up at late 20th century when cognitive psychology, the science of the mind, merged with neuroscience, the science of the brain. The result was a new biological science of mind that allowed us to address a range of questions about ourselves. How do we perceive, learn, and remember? What is the nature of emotion, empathy, and consciousness? This new biological science of mind is important not only because it provides a deeper understanding of what makes us who we are, but also because it makes possible a series of meaningful dialogues between brain science and other areas of knowledge. In a larger sense, these dialogues could help make science part of our common cultural experience. I'd like to take up this scientific challenge this morning by focusing on how the new biological science of mind has begun to engage with figurative art. In my life of a scientist, as you've heard, I've often benefited from taking a reductionist approach, as have many of you here. I try to explore a large problem that interests me. In my case, this has been a problem of memory storage, by initially focusing on its simplest example and trying to explore it deeply. I'll do so here this morning. I will limit my discussion to one particular art form, portraiture, in one particular cultural period, modernism in Vienna, 1900. I focus on portraiture because it is a highly suitable art form for scientific exploration. We now have the beginnings of intellectually satisfying understanding of how we respond to facial expressions and bodily postures of others. I focus on portraiture in the period Vienna 1900 because this artistic school of painters can be explored in depth. There are only three major artists, Klim, Kokoschka, and Schiele, yet the school is important in the history of art, both collectively and individually. As a group, they sought to depict the unconscious instinctual striving of the people in their portraits, yet each artist developed a distinctive way of using facial expressions and hand and body gestures to communicate his insights. In so doing, each artist made independent conceptual and technical contributions to modern art. Moreover, the concern of these artists with the truth lying beneath the surface appearance of their subject was parallel and influenced by similar concerns with unconscious mental processes and contemporaneous scientific medicine and psychoanalysis. Thus, the portraits of the modernists in Vienna 1900 also represent an ideal example of how artistic, psychological, and scientific insights can enrich one another. Let me begin by putting Viennese modernism into a bit of a perspective for you. Uh, modernism is thought to have begun in the mid-19th century in part as a response to the restrictions and hypocrisies of everyday life, but even more as a reaction to the enlightenment of the 18th century and its excessive emphasis on the rationality of human behavior. The enlightenment or age of reason was characterized by the belief that humans were specially created by God as rational creatures the different from other living creatures by having their actions guided by reasons. These Enlightenment beliefs were inspired by the extraordinary success of the scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th century. It was argued the success of this revolution derived from the application of reasoned thinking to the study of the universe by great rational minds such as those of Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, and Newton. The remarkable achievement of the scientific revolution was celebrated in 1660 with the formation of the Royal Society of London, of which Newton became president in 1703. The founders of the society thought of God as a mathematician who designed the universe to operate according to logical mathematical principles. In case you're not aware of it, this is not the Jewish definition of God. <laughs> the, the function of the scientists was to decipher the code book God had used to create the universe. This perspective led to the belief that we live in a rational world in which reason and enlightenment thought would ultimately lead to better condition for all humankind. In reacting to the enlightenment, modernism represented a search for a new worldview, a view partially provided by Charles Darwin. Darwin argued that humans are not uniquely created, but are biological creatures that have evolved from simpler animal ancestors. That evolution is driven by sexual selection 
so that from evolutionary perspective, the primary function of a biological organism is to reproduce itself. And three, since sexual attraction and mate selection are central to the behavior of all animals, sex must also be central to human behavior. A key to sexual attraction, mate selection, and lead to all social ex interactions is facial expressions and the emotions it mediates. Modernism has many roots. The Viennese form of modernism, which I call the Age of Insight, has three main features which still characterize the world we live in today. A new view of the human mind is not being rational, but being driven by unconscious sexual and aggressive drives. The conviction that the search for rules that govern the nature of human mind begins with an examination of oneself. And three, a broad attempt to integrate and unify knowledge and attempt driven by science. One example of this attempted integration was the initiation of a dialogue between art and science. This dialogue that originated in, uh, in Vienna 1900 had three phases. One, the independent discovery in Vienna of three different aspects of unconscious mental processes by two physicians, Freud and Schnitzler, I'm only gonna speak about Freud, and the three modern artists that I referred to before, Klimt, Kokoschka, and Schiele, all of whom I will argue were influenced by my hero, Karl von Markatansky, head of the Vienna School of Medicine. Two, the first attempt to bridge art to science, the science being psychology, by three Viennese art historians, very important, Alois Riegel, Ernst Chris, and Ernst Gombrich, and they focused on the beholder share, which I will tell you about. And finally, there was a bridging of art to science, this is really just beginning, through a biological analysis of the beholder share, an analysis that continues to this day, but it's got a significant distance to go. The first steps of which, interestingly enough, were taken in the 1950s by the visual physiologist Stephen Kruffler, who originally trained the Vienna School of Medicine, and he left Vienna for very much the same reason I did at about the same time. We both, he left in 38 and I left in 39. So let me begin with the first phase, medical science and art. It's amazing to think, but until the beginning of the 18th century, European medicine was in large part pre-scientific. The first step to an empirically based medicine were taken in Paris, 1800, in the aftermath of the French Revolution and the reforms that it brought about. But by 1840s, because of the conservatism of the July monarchy, creativity in French medicine decreased and the momentum moved from Paris to Vienna its university, its medical school, and its hospital, the Algemeine of Wiener Krankenhaus. I should tell you at the beginning, the reason this was so extraordinary is the Algemeine of Wiener Krankenhaus, which I will tell you about in great detail, was a hospital that belonged to the medical school, so it had the academic standards of a medical school. And the medical school belonged to the university, so it had the standards of the university, so very high standards dominated the whole scene. The first interest in having good medicine in Vienna came from Maria Theresa, and she did it because she wanted to win wars. And to win wars, you need to have healthy troops. And to need healthy troops, you need to have good medical care. So she brought Gerhard von Seaton, a very important uh, Swiss uh, uh, physician, to Vienna in 1745. And he began to introduce a more you know, rigorous approach to medical care. That led in 1784 to the building of the Vienna General Hospital, the Allgemeine Wiener Krankenhaus. And in 1844, it led to the recruitment of Karl von Markatansky as head of the Vienna General Hospital and also head of pathology. So what was so special about the Allgemeine Wiener Krankenhaus, the Vienna General Hospital. It, it differed from all other hospitals in Europe in the following terms. First of all, as I pointed out to you, it had very high academic standards. Two, everyone who died in Allgemeine Wiener Krankenhaus was autopsied. This was unheard of throughout the world. And number three, all the autopsies were done by one person, the head of pathology. So Karl von Markatansky did 80,000 autopsies. Now, Edward is beginning to worry. I assure you he didn't do it all with his tiny little hands. He had help, but he was involved in everything. Now, Markatansky said, 
before you can treat, you've got to understand what the nature of the illness is. You've got to make an accurate diagnosis. Now, the problem is we can't make accurate diagnoses. Physician listens to the chest. He hears the sound of the heart. Sometimes something may sound a little bit abnormal. He doesn't know what this is. Is this stenosis of the mitral valve? Is it aortic insufficiency? There was no way of knowing. He listens to the chest. He hears unusual sounds. He doesn't know, is this pneumonia? Is this pleurisy? Not the foggiest notion what's going on. So clearly what one has to do, Rokotansky argues, is to take a very good history, the bedside, do a very good physical examination. And if the patient dies, to do an autopsy and then a correlate the clinical symptomatology at the bedside with the anatomical findings at autopsy. He was fortunate enough to find a superb collaborator, Josef Skoda, and they revolutionized the understanding of medical disorders by introducing clinical pathological correlation. This was Rokotansky's great contribution. He provided the basis for modern scientific medicine through systematic clinical pathological correlation. The medicine that is practiced today, even in La Jolla. <laughs> is based upon this, is based on this fundamental principle. He emphasized the metaphor that influenced Freud a great deal. The truth is often hidden below the surface. He trained major leaders in academic medicine. I only mentioned Joseph Broy and Sigmund Freud because they come into the second part of my story. But he developed subdisciplines, gynecology, uh, dermatology, obstetrics, uh, urology. These disciplines didn't exist as discrete entities. He introduced them, had outstanding people leave them, and they were present in the Algemeine Wiener Krankenhaus. Uh, so he was a great stimulus to Sigmund Freud. Uh, Eduardo was kind enough to show you the last edition of Principles of Neural Science. Did anyone recognize the image on the cover? Please raise your hand if you recognize the image of the cover. Yes, because I told you you recognize the image. <laughs> uh, that is an anatomical drawing from Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud was an extraordinarily good anatomist, and he wanted to devote his career to biology of the nervous system. And I like him because, as that picture illustrates, that was based on a ganglion of a fish. He was the first one to realize that simple vertebrates and invertebrates had cells that are homologous to that of the human brain. So he really brought invertebrates into the mainstream of modern biology from a nervous system point of view. And Darwin had done this first in a general biological sense. So he wanted to devote himself uh, to the biology of the brain. Um, but in those days, in order to do research, you needed to have an independent income. And he didn't have that. He wanted to get married. He was already engaged. He wanted to have children. So he realized he had, wanted to have, needed to have a, a private practice. Um, and he looked around. He first thought he would go into neurology and actually wrote a couple of very good books in neurology, including an excellent book in aphasia. Um, and um, then he decided through an accident that he would go into psychiatry. And the accident was his friendship with Breuer. Breuer was also a neurologist, but practiced a lot of psychiatry and saw a patient by the name of Anna O oh that was just fascinating. Anna O oh had a hysterical paralysis of her right arm. And that's how she presented to Breuer. Breuer examined her, absolutely nothing wrong with her. And he started to treat her the way um, his historical uh, symptoms were treated in those days with hypnosis. But he noticed that in addition to the hypnosis, uh, she would occasionally talk to him about things, and he would interpret those things. So free association started with Breuer, and the interpretation of those in analytic context started with Breuer. So she described to Breuer that her father often liked to rest on her arm when he was tired and doze there for a little while. And while he was doing that, uh, she would have both positive and negative feelings about him. And he died in this position. And when he died, she developed this historical paralysis. And it was clear that part of this was due to these negative feelings. And as she talked about this, the symptoms resolved. Freud went wild. You know, 
went over and learned how to do hypnosis in Paris uh, and came back and started to practice this kind of sort of psychotherapy, dropped the hypnosis, and focused completely on psychoanalysis. In 1895, he wrote a very famous paper on uh, psychoanalysis for the neurologist. How many people in the audience have read that? Good. Don't bother. You did? <laughs> Excellent. The paper is essentially incomprehensible. Uh, <laughs> and he said, this is ridiculous. We just know nothing about the brain. The idea that you can take the mind and try to explain it in biological terms is vastly premature. So I'm going to develop a cognitive psychology. He didn't realize it was the first cognitive psychology, but I'm going to develop a theoretical system based on my observations and other people's observations. And someday, biology will mature and provide an understanding of this. So he took observable behavior, the patient's symptoms, normal behavior, and developed a model of this, a mental representation of conscious and unconscious mental processes. And he said, someday, neurobiologists would come along, you know, here at the Salk Institute, and they would pull all of this together. You know, hasn't quite happened yet, but we're getting somewhat closer. So to try to summarize Freud's enormous contributions in three key ideas is absurd, but that has not stopped me in the past, and it's not going to stop me now. So <laughs> he said human beings are not rational creatures. They are driven by irrational and unconscious mental processes. That adult character, including unconscious sexuality and aggression, can be traced to the mind of a child. That was really an extraordinary insight. The first was not completely original. The second one was original. And the third one was phenomenally original. No mental event occurs by chance. Mental events adhere to scientific laws and follow the principles of psychic determinism. So the reason free association is useful because Freud was convinced that one association connects to the next. So there, he can get some insight into what's going on by listening to the stream of associations. As a result of his contributions, Freud has emerged as a major source of a modern Rokotanskian inclination to look for meaning beneath the surface of behavior. And I should just add a little footnote to his relationship to Rokotansky. Um, in Vienna School of Medicine, uh, you could not do research unless you presented two papers a year to a public audience. Rokotansky sat in judgment of that presentation and had a sign off on it. And Freud presented twice to him, and each time Rokotansky was really very satisfied. When Rokotansky died, Freud wrote to a friend, oh, what a tragic day it was to lose this great leader of Viennese medicine. He was a great influence on me, and I miss him a great deal. When Freud died, several of the obituaries pointed out you know, he trained with Rokotansky in his early years. It isn't that fortunate because psychoanalysis is such a speculative science. Imagine where we would have gone if Freud had not trained with Rokotansky. However, there were certain important aspects of the human psyche that Freud failed to notice and that other Viennese modernists did. And in particular, Freud had very little insight into female sexuality. He thought women did not enjoy sex. Obviously, he'd never come to California. <laughs> and uh, that they only had sex in order to have children. They hoped they have boy children because boy ch uh, children have a penis. And as you know, he thought that women suffered from penis envy. The person who straightened him out was Gustav Klimt. I mean, he didn't straighten him, but the person who had a different view. And Gustav Klimt, as you know, slept with about 3,000 women, had a marvelous idea what female sexuality was about and how much women could enjoy sex. Uh, and he was influenced by Rodin. Rodin was the first artist who said to his models, look, don't pose for me. Just hang around my studio, take any position you're comfortable with, and when I find it interesting, I'll draw you. Klimt said the same thing, 
And in Vienna, you know, women after a while, when they were lying around, would you know, start entertaining themselves. They would masturbate. They might sleep with guys that came in. They might sleep with girls who came in. So they engaged in sexual activity when they were bored. And uh, Klimt would draw this in the most delicate, sensitive way, in no way pornographic. He would depict that women could enjoy sexuality as much as men. It was absolutely remarkable. In order to realize how original it is, you have to compare it to the history of the nude and Western art. And if you take a look at the nude and Western art, you realize that, that all of them are named after mythological characters. Venus, Venus, Maya, Olympia. The, this is not the girl next door that Klimt was painting, number one. Number two, you look at this, you realize that all four of these women are looking outward at the beholder, usually male, as if satisfying a male's sexual curiosity is their only task in life. If you look very carefully, you see three out of the four women are covering their pubic region. And you don't know, is this modesty or are they masturbating? With Klimt, there's never a moment's hesitation. You know exactly what's going on. But the most amazing thing of all of Klimt's work in oils is this painting of Judith. Uh, I think this is one of the most powerful paintings uh, in, in Western art. Uh, you know the story of Judith. There was an Assyrian siege of Bethulia, which is a small town near Jerusalem in 500 BC, led by a general, Assyrian general called Holofernes. Judith was a young widow, 26 years old, and after several weeks, the siege became unbearable. No diet, you know, sanitary conditions were awful. There was no food. So she thought she would do something to help her people, to try to save her people. She thought she would seek out Holofernes. So she snuck through the troops. She found Holofernes. He was celebrating at a party. She encouraged him to drink more. Then, when he was good and high, she persuaded him to take her to his tent, where they went ahead and had sex. And Holofernes fell asleep, exhausted by sex and drink. She took a sword off the wall and cut off his head. This has been repeatedly depicted in Western art. This heroic woman sacrificing herself for people, doing this horrible act that she detests in order to save her people. This is not Klimt's Judith. This is, Judith is still in a post-coital trance, fondling Holofernes' head, despite the fact that it's now been decapitated, exposing her left breast, having just a grand old time with the head of Holofernes. So what this really shows that women can not only enjoy the eroticism of sexuality, but there are aggressive elements that men sometimes manifest, and women are capable of manifesting that also under appropriate circumstances. Now, how did Mokotansky, who influenced Freud, and we can see what a profound influence he had on Freud, also influence Klimt? Well, of course, you know the answer to that. It's the Zuckerkandels. Emil Zuckerkandel was a colleague of Rokotansky's, and his wife, Beate Zuckerkandel, ran the great salon in Vienna. You were nobody if you were not invited to Beate Zuckerkandel's salon. She said, on my diva, Vienna comes alive. So great journalists came there, scholars came there, scientists came there, physicians came there, artists came there. And Klimt came there, and he met Zuckerkandl. And he became interested in biology. He began to read. When he died, Emily Braun, who examined his library, found there were four volumes of Darwin in his collection. How many people in this audience have four volumes of Darwin? Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> he really got extremely interested. He began to look into the, go, go to Tuka Kandel's lectures, began to look into the microscope, and he became particularly fascinated with images of sperm and of eggs. And he began to incorporate that into his paintings. This is a very famous painting called Zeus coming to Diana in a shower of golden raindrops, which is a famous legend. You see the shower of golden raindrops, and you see Diana, of course. But if you look very here, here, you see a rectangular symbol. That is Klimt's symbol for sperm. And if you look here, you see these circular symbols, ovum. This is Klimt's symbol for fertilized eggs. 
So here, Diana is a reproductive machine that converts sperm into a, an embryo. You look at, go back and look at a lot of Klimt's painting, for example, the kiss. You see the male's garment is covered with these sexual male symbols, the sperm, and her coat is covered with these circular symbols called ova. So he incorporated these biological themes into a lot of his work. The interesting thing about Klimt is that he not only was an extraordinary artist, the most famous artist of his day in Vienna, but he was extremely generous to younger artists, even though they did not work directly with him. So Kokoschka and Schiele were not trained by Klimt, but he supported them extremely. Um, and each of them therefore felt free to move into their own direction, and each developed a very distinctive direction. Klimt was um, an Art Nouveau artist. By the way, look at the symbols on Adel Bauer, these rectangular symbols which you now recognize as sperm and these circular ones which are over. He always had a decorative background and very beautiful kinds of decorations that uh, surrounded his images. Um, and uh, Kokoschka was very different than this. Uh, he had an interest to go below the surface, where Klimt usually stopped, to explore his own emotional reactions in self-portraits and other people's reactions in, in, in the portraits he painted of them. Also, he emphasized the hands as a way of conveying a, an additional source of uh, emotions. And finally, he was interested in child and adolescent sexuality. So unlike this decorative background, if you look at Klimt, he really is an expressionist artist, influenced by, uh, by Munch in many ways. Uh, he uh, began to sort of paint a background that created a mood rather than depicted reality. Uh, he also was very honest in depicting himself. Klimt never did any self-portraits, but Kokoschka did several self-portraits because he argued, very much like Freud did, that the best way to understand other people is to first study yourself. Freud, simply to remind you, at the end of each day, spent 45 minutes just analyzing himself. And Kokoschka, I don't know how much time he spent on it, but very much aware of himself. And his, his self-portraits, he depicted himself in an honest way. Uh, Alma Mahler, Gustav Mahler's widow, um, had an affair with Kokoschka uh, and brought him to a new level of creativity. But Alma Mahler, you know, was uh, historically unfaithful, and, and, and uh, Kokoschka realized it was just a question of time before he would lose her. So all the time he was with her, he was extremely insecure about that. I don't know whether any of you have got, uh, been to Basel and seen the tempest. The two of them were together lying in a little boat. Uh, she's sleeping away peacefully, uh, thinking about her next lover. Uh, but Kokoschka, in the meantime, looks like he's on the verge of a nervous breakdown, ready to jump overboard. And here, this is after he broke up with Alma Mahler, still exceedingly insecure, biting his, uh, sort of sucking on his fingertips. And you notice the redness of, of both the lips and the fingertips. And the coloration is not necessarily to depict a natural situation, but to bring out uh, emotion. And again, his use of hand and body position was designed to bring out these feelings. Now, he felt very much like Freud, that if he studied somebody in the course of painting their portrait, he would be able to predict their future. And he was very lucky. There was an architect by the name of Adolf Loos, a very well-known architect, who thought Kokoschka was terrific. Um, and he would approach people. He'd go to Eduardo Macania and say, you're a great scientist. You've evolved into a great administrator. You deserve to have your portrait painted. Uh, let uh, Kokoschka do this. If you don't like it, I'll take it back. Well, why, why turn an offer like this down? So one of the people he approached was Auguste Farrell, a great psychiatrist, professor of psychiatry at the University of Zurich and director of the Bicolsi, famous psychiatric hospital. Um, and so he painted his portrait over a two-week period, coming after dinner and painting it. When it was finished, Farrell looked at it, and his family looked at it, and they said, we don't like it. Look, the two eyes are uneven, and look at the right hand. 
it's drooping. It looks like he had a stroke. We don't like it at all. So Lowe's took it back, sold it to a museum. Two months later, Farrell had exactly this stroke. Exactly how this happens, we don't know, but it is not unheard of that prior to having a stroke, people have an ischemic episode, which manif because you know the arteries are already narrowed, so in, without having a final closure, they could clamp down for a second, and you see the symptoms that ultimately occurs during the stroke, and probably this is what uh, Kokoschka saw. He also was the first one to depict adolescent uh, female nudes. Durer had done a self-portrait of himself an adolescent, but no one had done female nudes. And uh, 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 this was Lee. If you know the Traum de Knabe, this wonderful set of images he did on Lee, this woman he had an unconsummated relationship with. This is a drawing of her. Uh, but he also went even younger, and he realized, as Freud did, that um, sexual and aggressive impulses don't begin at puberty or later, they begin in early child life. And this is the Stein children, a very wealthy family, these two kids <coughs> playing on the floor. And you see that their feelings are touched by both aggression and sexuality. The boy, Walter, is pulling in Lotta's hand, trying to get a little bit closer to him. And she doesn't completely object that, but she's worried about the degree of closeness. And she already she clenches her right fist, ready to punch him in the nose in case he gets too far. Ernst Gombrich was tremendously influenced by this. And he wrote about this painting in the following way. In the past, a child in a painting had to look pretty and contented. Grown-ups did not want to know about the sorrows and agonies of childhood, and they resented it if this aspect of it was brought home to them. So the reason they hired a painter to do their children is to have a romantic, beautiful, happy portrayal. But Kokoschka would not fall in with these demands of convention. We feel that he's looked at these children with deep sympathy and compassion. <clears throat> he has caught their wistfulness and dreaminess, the awkwardness of their movement and disharmonies of their growing body. His work is all the more true to life for what it lacks in conventional accuracy. And third and last for the artist <clears throat> is Egon Schiele. Schiele is remarkable and the most radical of the three. He didn't simply use, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> face and hands, but the total self, the whole body, as an object for exploring the existential anxiety of modern life an exploration that he felt is best done in the nude. He did a lot of paintings of himself with his lover and then later pictures of his wife making love. And even when they're making love, they look like they're on the verge of a nervous breakdown. <laughs> he really, more than any other artist, depicted, and this is just when World War I had, was about to break out, or had broken out, the anxieties of modern life, which really quite dramatic. Um, I told you before that Klimt painted no self-portrait. Kokoschka did a few. Sheila did 100 self-portraits between 1910 and 1911. Most of these were done nude in various postures in order to sort of convey certain emotions that he had. Moreover, he was outrageous. He painted pictures of himself masturbating. He, you know, I'm arguing this. Klimt showed nudes masturbating. Why shouldn't he show uh, female nudes, why shouldn't he show a man masturbating? And if it's going to be a man, why shouldn't it be him? So one of the things he did was really following Velasquez's lead. He tried to shift the emphasis of the painting to the artist. The reason you buy this painting is because I, the artist, did it. I'm the really critical person in art. I want to turn to the second phase, and that is the psychology of art. This is an extraordinarily interesting phase that is still going on to this moment. And I think, although it's not appreciated, this phase do completely derives from the Vienna School of Art History. And an extraordinary guy is Alois Riegel. Um, Riegel argued that art history is going to die unless it becomes scientific. And the science it ought to relate itself to is psychology. And the problem it ought to focus on is the beholder share. 
how does the viewer respond to a work of art? The artist paints a work of art, and the beholder, the viewer, responds to it. Now, that's obvious. But no one had pointed this out, and no one had said, this is a particular subject you ought to focus on if you want to get a scientific understanding of what art is about. Uh, the picture is never complete unless you have somebody responding to it. This challenge was taken up by two of his later disciples, Ernst Chris, who also later became a great psychoanalyst and was a big influence on me, and Ernst Gombrich, a student of Chris's. Ernst Chris said, great art is ambiguous. When Eduardo and I look at the same painting, we see it somewhat differently. What does that mean? That each of us is undergoing a creative response in response to the work of art. And that creative response is different for him than it is for me. So the beholder's share reflects the beholder's creativity. Thus the beholder recapitulates in a modest way the creativity of the artist. This is a fascinating insight, and it's consistent with what we heard before about architecture. The beholder is really experiencing something which is quite original. And one of the reasons people enjoy art so much is because it brings out this creative capability. People get great pleasure out of their own creativity. I don't know whether you feel this way. Liz, you must feel this way. I have the crappiest idea in science. I put together two obvious ideas, and I feel good for the rest of the day. There is a pleasure to just coming up with ideas, and he realized this. And Ernst Gombrich really picked this up. He thought he wanted to understand the science of perception, how to respond to works of art. <clears throat> and he began to read about this, and he read uh, Bishop Berkeley and discovered the inverse optics problem. And that is, when I look at somebody, when I look, for example, at Eduardo again, um, the only I don't see Eduardo's face. I don't see the details of the beard or the hair. I just see the photons that bounce off his face. That's all the retina really perceives. And yet I see Eduardo. I see him exactly the same way from day to day, decade for decade. And we all see him in pretty much the same way. So there must be additional information besides the photons that hit my retina that my brain uses in order to recreate the Eduardo Macanio that I see. What is that? And Helmholtz, Hermann Helmholtz, first said there are two kinds of information, and Tom Albright has written about this, bottom up and top down. Bottom up is our brain did not evolve yesterday. It evolved over millions of years of evolution, and it evolved its visual system to handle the everyday problems of visual perception. So the routine perception of everyday life is carried out by these bottom up processes. If I see a source of light, I assume it's above because the sun is above. If I see one person much larger than the other, I assume they're closer to me because that's the way perspective is constructed. So much of normal vision is carried up with these bottom-up processes. But in addition, we live different lives. We look at different works of art. We have different relationships. We learn things. And that also influences how we look at a, per a work of art. It determines how we look at anything. And that top-down process is a learned thing. And again, this is something all about a study. Let me just give you an example. If bottom-up processing in part involves a set of assumptions that is right you know, 98% of the time, we should be able to trick it periodically. And people have tried to do that, some successfully and some not. This is a famous Kanesiza square. You have a black square on top of four white circles. Do you all see that? I just want to make sure. Can all of you see this clearly delineated uh, black square? Raise your hand if you see it. You all see it. Good. I'm glad you're seeing it. You're deceiving yourself. The square is not there. You're making it up in your own head. If you rotate these four white images, you see that the square is what you filled in to the empty space between them. If those uh, semicircles are lined up correctly, you will fill in this black image. But the black image is not there as a black image qua black image. So visual perception is illusory. 
and the textbook examples only represent the extreme cases. So Chris and Gummidge reached a sort of a three-step analysis of the beholder share, it really in parallel with Freud. There's the beholder's behavior, the mental representation, perception, emotion, empathy, and someday brain mechanisms would come along that will help explain that. And we're now in the era where for the first time, the brain mechanisms are slowly beginning to emerge. We're far from being there, but hopefully we will be able to do that. So let me end by showing you some of the early insights into the brain mechanisms that the beholder share. I can show you a flow diagram of the neural circuits involved in the beholder share from a point of view of portraiture. We look at another person's face, so the analysis of facial contours, representing the facial details that occurs in the infratemporal cortex, the amygdala, representation of the body, analysis of the body when it's in motion, simulation of it, reacting with, to it in psychologically, theory of mind, understanding what's going on in the mind of the person you're talking to or the mind of the person that's being depicted and having psychological insight into another person. Let me just give you a couple of examples of that. Let's begin with analysis of facial contours. Uh, as Darwin first pointed out, um, the reason we respond to portraitures is because faces are so special to us. Uh, they're essential for social interactions. We recognize each other, and sometimes we even recognize ourselves by means of a face. And we use face to communicate emotion, to find a partner. Uh, in business relationships, we can tell whether we're comfortable with somebody or not because of the emotional response in their face. And faces are treated differently by the brain from all other objects. There is more area in the brain devoted to face recognition than to any other object in the universe. Computers that have enormous computational capability compared to us have great difficulty with faces, but we do it with enormous facility. Little kids can recognize hundreds of faces. You can put a kid, a two or three year old kid in a monkey colony Within a short period of time, they can tell the difference between 100 different monkeys. We as adults would have great difficulty telling the difference between six different monkeys, but young kids have enormous capability for face recognition. And not only that, if we see a line drawing, for example, of Rembrandt's self-portrait, we recognize the face as well, and if it's distorted, if it's exaggerated, like a cartoon, we recognize it even better. So facial representation is enhanced if it's in any way distorted. Let me tell you why faces are so unique, because they're treated by the brain differently from any other object. If I take an object like this bottle of water and turn it upside down, I would spill the water, but you'd recognize the bottle as a bottle without any difficulty. Take a look at Mona Lisa. Those of you who know it realize this is Leonardo's great uh, painting hanging in the Louvre, but you know you see no difference between them. But if I turn it upside down, you'll see that ups what you are really seeing is the Mona Lisa in a significantly distorted form. But upside down, you can't see it. So with faces, you don't recognize detail upside down. And if you don't know the person, you have difficulty time even recognizing what's going on. How are faces represented? Well, this has an interesting history a relatively recent one. We didn't know how faces were represented until 1947 when the German neurologist Joachim Barma first recognized a disorder of the inferior temporal cortex called face blindness, prosop agnosia, agnosia of the face. You have four lobes in your brain. I hardly need to tell this audience that. The occipital lobe, temporal lobe, parietal lobe, and frontal lobe. In this area right here, getting input from the visual cortex, the temporal lobe feeds into this area, and this is the area for face representation. If you have an area here near the visual cortex, primary visual cortex, you have complete face blindness. You don't recognize a face qua face. Oliver Sacks' famous story, the man who mistook his wife for a hat, a woman takes her husband to a physician because he has a problem and the interview is over, He's ready to leave. He picks up his wife's head and tries to put it on his head, thinking his wife's head is a hat. So this is clearly very serious. Uh, 
you don't get away with many wives doing that kind of stuff. Um, but if you have a lesion more anteriorly, which occurs in 10% of all people, you recognize a face qua face, but you have difficulty recognizing who that is. Chuck Close has face blindness. And the reason he takes a photograph of the people he paints is he begins with a photograph, puts it down, and then puts a paper over it and draws on top of the photograph. But without that photograph, he would not be able to do a painting of you compared to a painting of somebody else. Uh, we now have a detailed understanding of how the cellular representation of faces occurs. This began when Charlie Gross began to record in his infratemporal cortex, and he saw that some cells would respond to faces and some responded to, to more complex objects. Uh, but he made one realize this interesting stuff there. And Margaret Livingston, two of his students, Doris Sauer and Winfried Freiwald, have recently combined brain imaging with cellular recordings, and they've come up with a remarkable set of findings, one of the most important findings in visual physiology since Hubel and Weasel 25 years ago. They found there are, in fact, six patches in this region, which they call face patches, that respond exclusively to faces. If you record in any of those patches, 95% of the cells respond only to faces. If you stimulate the central patches, you activate the peripheral patches. So these are interconnected. This is a system for processing faces. And different parts of the system do different jobs. Profiles, head-on view, multiple views, etc. So we really get a wonderful insight into how the system is organized. And let me just give you an example how this works, because it's really quite fascinating. If you show a monkey, an image of a monkey, brrrr, cell in the face patch goes off. Monkeys like to look at face of, of monkeys. If you show them a cartoon of a monkey, they respond to cartoons even better than to faces. It goes brrrr. That's interesting. Doesn't require a nose. Oh, no. 30 or 40 minutes is fine. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm within roughly that, OK? Um, <laughs> Why noses are not important, one can't be sure. But it's interesting, noses don't change very importantly with expression, while the eyes and the mouth do. So if you move the mouth, no response. Remove the eyes, no response. Remove the circle, even though you've got the eyes and the mouth, no response. Circle, no, no response. You've got to have the whole schmear to get the response. But if you exaggerate, if you move the eyes further apart or bring them closer together, cells go wild. If you turn it upside down, it doesn't respond. So because you only gave me another 45 minutes, I'll be short. Uh, we now know about the representation of these other areas, and I'll just show you a little bit about this. Um, visual information comes in here, the stride cortex. And it feeds, as I told you, to the face processing areas. We have an addition area here called the lateral occipital cortex, where visual and tactile uh, interactions occur. And this is very important in looking at art. Because many paintings, for example, Jackson, Pollock, de Kooning, Soutine, have a layering of the paint. And you feel this is a tactile quality. Berenson commented on this early on, that in many paintings, you feel you, with your body, you actually want to sort of touch the painting because it has this tactile quality. And this area is critically involved in that. There's an extra stripe body area. There's a motion body area. That responds to all motion, motion of a car, motion of a bicycle, et cetera. But in addition, there's an area that is involved in biological motion. Now, if I reach my hand out to a person, and that person is autistic, it will respond to a car moving, but it will not respond to my reaching my hand out. That's a social gesture that requires somebody who does not have autistic problems. So this is very interesting. So you see a representation not only of the eyes, you know, classical, that autistic people don't look you in the eye, they look down. When they look at the portrait, they look down, they don't look at the eyes of the object. Um, in addition to biological motion, there are two areas that are involved with uh, mirror neuron functions. Uh, now, when uh, I pick up this cup, those cells fire. 
That's not surprising. We pay the motor system to allow me to pick that up. But what's interesting about these two areas, these two areas fire when you pick up a glass of water. So they respond in a mirror fashion to your activity. And now people think that when the kids acquire language, they're not only hearing their mothers speak to them in the tongue that she's using, but also looking at a facial expression, et cetera, and copying that. And then finally, there's an area concerned with theory of mind understanding that you as a person function differently than me. It's, again, something that's disturbed in autistic people. Now, in addition, this is my final point, there are areas that are involved in emotion. So there's the hypothalamus, which is the executive emotion, the amygdala, which is the orchestrative emotion, and dopamine, which is the modulative emotion. And I just want to give you a couple of examples of this. I showed you with Gustav Klimt this amazing thing of eroticism and aggression. And you pick up the newspaper every day and you realize how somebody flipped from eroticism to aggression. How something turned into rape that started out to be a fairly decent uh, romantic experience. And how does one explain that? Well, David Anderson really made an amazing discovery. He found that there are cells in the hypothalamus that mediate mating, erotic behavior, and those that mediate aggression. And in between, there's a population that's shared. 20% of the neurons are shared. If you stimulate them weakly, foreplay, it's involved in eroticism. If you stimulate them strongly, they get involved with aggression. So we see here a fusion of Freud, Klimt, and Chile, the new science of the mind, how we're beginning to get an insight and how you can flip from one to another. These areas are closely interconnected. And maybe if we can get drugs that you know, determine the thresholds of this, we can make progress through this. And finally, I'm with a goal. I can, uh, brain science, we read something about love of art. You all know the story about uh, Ronald Lauder. He fell in love with Adele Bochbauer, this painting. Uh, when he was a young boy, eight years old, he came to Vienna, he saw this for the first time, and he said, this is modern womanhood. This is absolutely the mo modern Mona Lisa. This is a painting I must have. He comes from a very wealthy family, he tried to buy the painting. He said, it's ridiculous, belongs to the museum. Couldn't get it. What does this happen to a brain? It activates the orbital frontal cortex, and it gets the modulatory systems of the brain going. Now, the dopaminergic system, which gets recruited for this, um, affects all areas of the beholder share, and it is activated by primary rewards like food, drink, and sex, like addicts have activation of the dopamine system, addiction, romantic love, and love of art. Now, many of you may have experienced that. When you're rejected by a, a person that you love very much, that dopamine system gets turned on even more. You want them even more than you did before because you've been rejected. And Laura goes and visits this painting time and time again. Each time it's rejected, he becomes ambassador from the United States to Austria, lives in Vienna, sees the damn painting all the time, can't possibly get it. So when it came on the market, he gladly paid what he, 130 million. Look at this, this dopamine system was going off the wall. He was going wild. <laughs> so he would have paid not 130, he would have paid 135 million if he. So let me conclude. E. Wilson said, the greatest enterprise for the human mind, and we heard this before, is the linkages between the sciences and the humanities. Viennese modernists were among the first to establish these linkages in art and science by focusing on the beholder share. And their pioneering attempt in this great ent enterprise continues at the Salk Institute, where the spirit of modernism is carried forward to this day. Thank you very much. <laughs> Should we have some questions? Do we have time for questions? Or? I'm sorry? But do you want to entertain one or two questions? From, two questions. I'm here, madam. Yeah. 
Yes, but he, he said to wait, he has to. He said he has to turn it up. Okay, he's turned it up. Good. Okay, I'm really excited about this concept of beholder's share. I hadn't heard it before, but I see that it is exactly the equivalent in architecture to what we call the user perspective, or what Herbert Gans called the audience perspective rather than the creator perspective. Architecture typically likes to look at the creator, well, of course. not at the audience and or the user. So. I'm just very excited that this user language that we've had for 40 years in the Environmental Design Research Association is got links with something um, much, shall we say, older. I, I'm, so uh, if you have anything more to add about beholder uh, share, I, I'd I com love I to hear it. I completely agree with you. I have argued this, that you know, if you speak to American art historians, they don't know Alois Regal. I was in a discussion yesterday and somebody said they had read Alois uh, Regal. But the fact is, if you look at the literature written by American art historians, they never cite him. That whole school of the Cambridge, who went to England, you know, continued to write for a very popular audience, is very well known. And Ernst Chris is known in analytic circles, but Regal, who set the whole thing going, is not known. Behold the share is an extremely important concept because it put the whole relationship between brain science and art on a scientific basis, you had a starting point, a simple systems approach, if you will. Thank you. Well, well uh, we might get one more question, but the time is up. Uh, do you have one more question? Hi, Justin. Um, this is a great, oops, sorry. Oh, good, and I'm just tall enough. Um, <laughs> So this is a great power over me as you should. <laughs> it's a rare moment, thank you. <laughs> um, yesterday, Kurt Hunker and I gave a lecture on uh, criticism, architectural criticism, and the conclusion that we didn't quite have a moment to reach was that architectural criticism has lost the art of talking about the user's perspective, and this is filtered into the critiques that happen in our schools of architecture and also in our process itself. And so this language, I think Stephen actually referred to it, that the intersection of the beholder's perspectives and the brain's basis for understanding that is, I think, something that can help us to change both practice and education. So the big, so I thank you for that. I thank you both for that. Um, the big question I, I have that I think we all struggle with as designers is understanding that the subconscious has a role in the act of intuition, which is where architects tend to stop when they think about art. I, I was thinking of doing your talk, but you just filled with creativity. Uh, and the pleasure you get out of it, which is, I think, universal by people who have this capability, um, is something that Ernst Chris studied and he called it regression in the service of the ego. Now, psychotic people regress because they lose control of you know, the boundaries between the ego and their unconscious, but creative people control that and can have access to the unconscious, the fantasies, the unstructured life, the space, the light. That's represented in a disorganized way that can be organized, and this is what I think creative people take uh, hold of. We don't understand that yet in detail, but we're beginning to make rather good progress in understanding in neurobiological terms the various kinds of unconscious processes that exist and studying them. So I would think, you know, in the next 50 years, we'd really, I mean, this is very early days, we'd really get a very good understanding of it. And what's wonderful about this and why I was so thrilled to come, even though I had something scheduled for, yet yeah, I'd move things around in order to do this, is that these kinds of discussions are extremely important. It's important to get people who are artists interacting. We started a program right now at Columbia in which we have an artist in residence. Uh, and uh, Jeff Coons, who's a friend of mine, has agreed to be the first artist in residence. And my hope is that not only will we learn a lot from him about his creative process, but he will look at brain science. And in our building, we're gonna have, actually this interesting thing, you might think about this at the SOG, we have a walkthrough where the community can walk through the building, and there will be on display images of what's going on in the building, artistic depiction of what's going on. And it might inspire artists to get ideas 
for works of art that might not have done it by giving him some familiarity of the brain. Great. Thank you.